Okay everyone, welcome to the 2pm tutorial this week, week 9, being the endocrine system. We're going to focus on hormones and glands and we're going to focus on some very specific hormones and glands. Uh, I think the best way to do it is a top to toe, oh sorry I'll turn that off, let me just fix that up. I think the best way to do it is a top to toe mechanism, so we basically Start at the brain, and when I say start at the brain, I mean start at the hypothalamus. But before we do all that, a couple of things. If you have any questions, you just pop it down in the chat, and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, you need to understand the difference between the endocrine system and the nervous system, right? And so remember that the nervous system, which we've spoken about before, you know, you've got a neuron, and we know that neurons like to release neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters, they will cross the synapse, which is a very small gap, and they will bind directly to receptors on either another neuron, for example, or on cells, right? So when you look at nervous tissue, it is a mechanism of communication. It releases neurotransmitters, and neurotransmitters are chemicals, right? We went through a big list of these neurotransmitters. Can we go through the adrenal gland and the pancreas? Very confusing in the lecture. Not a problem, Maddie. I'll make sure I definitely will. Hopefully I'm pronounced Matey, Maddie, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. So when we look at the communication network of a neuron, releases neurotransmitters, chemicals, that very specifically bind to something very locally, which is either another neuron or a cell, right? Now when we look at the endocrine system, it's a cell or a collection of cells, right? There's a cell, that's a little nucleus there, that release chemicals just like these, except these chemicals are called hormones. But these chemicals don't just bind to something really close to it, it actually jumps into the bloodstream. And these hormones or chemicals jump into the bloodstream and they travel to different parts of the body. Now what that means is the difference between the nervous system and endocrine system is they're both mechanisms of communication. They both use chemicals except the chemicals in the nervous system are called neurotransmitters and the chemicals for the endocrine system are called hormones. Neurons and neurotransmitters are very fast. The endocrine system is slow. The nervous system is very direct. It goes from that to that. The endocrine system goes from that to everywhere in the body. All right. So these are some of the major differences between the nervous system and endocrine system. Hi Dr. Mike, uh, some time throughout the tutorial can we please go through the specific hormones of the anterior pituitary? I promise you we will because it's a lot and it can be a little bit confusing. Confusing. The crux of today's shoot will be the hypothalamus and pituitary glands and the hormones they release and what exactly they do. Because what you're going to find is in your end of trimester exam, most of the endocrine questions will probably be around the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. Maybe. Who knows? I do because I wrote it. All right, let's now have a look at a couple of things. When we look at hormones, so I said that they're chemicals, but these chemicals can either be amino acids, they can be proteins, which we know are just big stretches of amino acids that have been folded into three-dimensional structures, and steroids. So the three different types of hormones you can have are amino acid, proteins, and steroids. All right, here's the thing. When we look at the way that they bind to their receptors, because obviously they're chemicals. In order for a chemical to have an effect, it must bind to a receptor, right? Amino acids and proteins, if here's a cell that has a receptor for one of these hormones, right? It, it's either an amino acid-based hormone or it's a protein-based hormone, it doesn't matter. What's going to happen is that it needs to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell. And the reason why it needs to bind on the outside of the cell is because amino acids and proteins, they can't freely move into and out of the cell. So in order for it to tell the cell to do something, it must bind to a receptor on the outside 
binds to extra cellular receptors. Right? And then this signal's transduced inside and then it tells the cell to do its thing, whatever that may be. Uh, we've got a question. I was confused on the structure of the posterior and anterior pituitary glands. Something about one of them not being connected to the hypothalamus. Yes, Olivia, great question. When we look at steroid hormones, steroid hormones are cholesterol-based, which means they're lipophilic. Lipophilic, as you know, means it loves fat. Now, what is fatty? The outer layer of our cells. So if a steroid hormone wants to exert its effects on a cell, it just moves straight into the cell. And what it usually exerts its effects on are the DNA directly. And it tells that DNA to transcribe and translate particular genes. So what's the difference between Amino acid, protein, and steroid hormones. Amino acid and protein hormones must exert their effects on receptors on the outside. Steroid hormones must exert their effects by binding to intracellular receptors. Right? So there's a big difference when it comes to the receptors. All right, next point. I want you to tell me of these three, which one do you think has the shortest half-life? So if one of these is released into our bloodstream, which one do you think gets degraded first? Answer it for me. Pop it in the chat. Is it the amino acids? Is it the proteins? Or is it the steroids? And if you make a statement, I want you to have an educated guess as to why you think that's the one that has the shortest half-life. What do we got? So we've got steroids from Reef. Any justification, any reasoning? Was it a guess or is there anything about it? structure that makes you think steroids. Does anyone have any other guesses? Uh, anyone want to, what do we got? We've got um, other proteins and amino acids, the water soluble hormones. Correct. Amino acids and proteins are water soluble, which means they like water, they can mix in with it. And think about what that means. The blood is mostly water. So usually these ones can just freely float through the bloodstream. They don't need anything to carry them. Steroid hormones, they don't like being in the bloodstream, but they're a hormone, so they have to be in the bloodstream. So they need carrier molecules. They're non-water soluble, so they need proteins. They're not protein hormones, just other proteins like albumin, for example, that piggyback the steroids. Uh, because most cells within the body are lipid soluble. That's true. Uh, the pro okay. Uh, you know what? That's really good justification, Reef. It's not the case. Steroids actually last, steroids and proteins sort of last the longest between four minutes to 170 minutes in the body. And amino acids and short proteins last two to four minutes. That's their half-life. I shouldn't say that's how long they last in total. That's how long it takes before half of that hormone is no longer existent. So short amino acids and short proteins, two to four minutes. Long proteins and steroids, four to 170 minutes. And the one that lasts the longest is actually a protein called thyroid hormone, which just really doesn't act like other hormones. Thyroid hormone, even though it's a protein-based hormone, exerts its effect inside the cell, which is strange because no other protein-based hormone does. And it can last in the body from zero to six days. That's its half-life within the body. Um, all right, now let's start talking about the hypothalamus and let's start talking about the anterior posterior pituitary glands and answer some of those questions. All right, first thing you need to know is that if I were to draw up the brain, where's the hypothalamus? There's the brain, there's the midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord, cerebellum, all right? This is the front of the brain, so anterior, this is the back of the brain, posterior. Now the hypothalamus sits under the thalamus and the thalamus is around about here. So the hypothalamus is around about here. It sits on the medulla basically, right? The medulla is the top of the brain stem we've spoken about, oh, sorry, midbrain, midbrain pons medulla. The hypothalamus sits on the midbrain. Now underneath the hypothalamus, it, there's this little dangly thing and that's called the pituitary gland. So what we're gonna focus on is that area right now because the hypothalamus is an amazing structure. 
it is what we call the master regulator of both the endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system. All right. So if I were to draw up the hypothalamus, brief, just quickly. Now, I'm going to draw up these two dangly things. They are very phallic looking, so I do apologize, but that's just an exaggeration of what the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland looks like. So, we've got the hypothalamus here. Hypo meaning below thalamus because that's where it sits. And what the hypothalamus does is it receives a whole bunch of sensory input. So if you see something or you feel something or you taste something or experience something, whatever it may be, there's going to be signals coming into the hypothalamus. It likes receiving these signals. If something happens to an organ of your body, signal gets sent to the hypothalamus. If something's happening in your brainstem, signal goes to the hypothalamus, right? And it decides if it needs to do something and what it needs to do. So, the hypothalamus, being the master regulator of the endocrine system, usually exerts its effects via the pituitary gland. And you can see that there's two lobes to the pituitary gland. We've got the anterior pituitary gland, or at least the anterior lobe, and the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. All right, that's the first thing. Second thing is that the hypothalamus will speak to either of these and tell them to release hormones into the bloodstream to have their effect, depending on what signal the hypothalamus received. All right? What I want to first start off with is the anterior pituitary gland because it has the most hormones, so it's worth probably most of the discussion. The way that the hypothalamus speaks to the anterior pituitary gland is via a bloodstream. There's actually a bloodstream that connects the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland and this bloodstream is called the hypophyseal portal system. That's what this is called, the hypo, so hypo, fissile, so hypophyseal portal system. Basically, the hypothalamus has hormones in it, and it releases these hormones into the hypophyseal system. The hormones travel down until they hit the anterior pituitary gland, and then they release their hormones out into the body. So when we talk about the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary gland, we need to talk about what hormones the hypothalamus releases and what hormones the anterior pituitary gland releases. Let's first start with the hypothalamus. Now, I'm going to number these hormones. These numbers don't mean anything. There's no order to these hormones. It's just so we can compare which hormone up here regulates which hormone down here. And again, if you have any questions at any point, just pop it in the chat and I'll try my best to answer it. All right, so the first hormone I want to talk about here First hormone I want to talk about is corticotropin releasing hormone. Corticotropin releasing hormone. The next hormone I'm going to write down is going to be thyrotropin releasing hormone. You're going to see a bit of a pattern here with releasing hormone. Next one we want to talk about is growth hormone releasing hormone. And then the last one we need to talk about is gonadotropin releasing hormone. All right, here's the thing. All of the hormones in the hypothalamus have that releasing hormone at the end of it. 
and it's because they're going to tell another hormone to be released, right? The term tropin, which you constantly see, what that means is tropin is a hormone that goes to another cell to tell that cell to release another hormone. So there's actually many layers to how many hormones are released here. The hypothalamus releases a hormone to tell the anterior pituitary gland to release a hormone, to tell another tissue or structure to release a hormone. And so the tropin is what demonstrates that there's still one more hormone to be released somewhere in the body, okay? So let's start off with corticotropin releasing hormone. Let's just say this is the one that needs to be released and it's released from the hypothalamus and it travels down through this hypophyseal portal system and it gets released at the anterior pituitary gland. The hormone that the corticotropin releasing hormone releases at the anterior pituitary gland is something called adrenocorticotropic hormone. Is this called cascades? Yeah, cascading effects is simply, that's great. Cascading effects is when one thing leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another. And in this case, tropins are cascading effects. The hormones, so basically the endocrine system, is so, it's one of the most complex systems we're going to talk about because of, as Reef said, it's cascading. One hormone leads to a release of a dozen other hormones and this always happens and that's why it gets really difficult. Um, what about prolactin releasing hormone? Yes, so I could put prolactin releasing hormone in there. The reason why I haven't is because I didn't want to overburden you. I didn't want to discuss. Let's put it in. Let's put it in. Prolactin releasing hormone. Because we will talk about it. Thanks. Thanks, Maddie. All right. So we, let's start with the first one. Corticotropin releasing hormone. It's moved down the hypophyseal portal system. It's now in the anterior pituitary gland. And it releases a particular hormone. Like I said, it's called adrenocorticotropic hormone. So now let's write these ones up, right? So one. So the one that corresponds with number one here is number one here, adrenocorticotropic hormone. So I'll just write H, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Sometimes you see it written as A-C-T-H. All right, what does adrenocorticotropic hormone do? Because this is now getting released from the anterior pituitary gland and it's gonna have its effect somewhere. So let's read the name, Adreno. What do you think Adreno is referring to? Anyone? Adreno, Adreno, what do you think it is? I know there's a bit of a delay with the video, but what do you think? Adreno refers to adrenaline, okay. In part it does. Where does adrenaline get released from? Adrenal gland, thank you Olivia. Yes, the adrenal gland. So this is where ACTH has its effect, Whoa. is the adrenal gland. Cortico is referring to the cortex of the adrenal gland, which is the outer shell. And tropic means that when it goes to the adrenal gland, it's telling it to release another hormone. Does that make sense? I hope it does. ACTH is a hormone that goes to the adrenal gland, specifically the cortex of the adrenal gland, and because it's a tropic hormone, it's going to tell the cortex of the adrenal gland to release another hormone. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. I want to draw the adrenal gland now, answer one of those questions I think that Maddie had before about how does the adrenal gland, what does it release? How does it release it? What does it do? All right. So ACTH has been released. Now I'm just going to draw it up over here because we've got more room. Okay. So adrenocorticotropic hormone has been released. It travels to the adrenal gland. Now, in actual fact, I always say this and it simplifies it and students get confused. It's traveling everywhere in the body, right? When that gets released from the anterior pituitary gland, it's in the bloodstream that goes everywhere. It just happens to be that the receptors specific for ACTH bind at the adrenal gland, all right? So we draw up the kidney and the adrenal gland is the hat that sits on the kidney. So it's going here. Now, if I were to draw up the adrenal gland more specifically, so you know it sits on the, we've got two kidneys, so we've got two adrenal glands, right? It goes to both of them. If I were to draw up the adrenal gland, 
you're going to find that there's an outer shell at here, which is called the cortex, and the inner medulla. All right. Adrenal corticotropic hormone stimulates most specifically the cortex. What does it stimulate the cortex to release? Let's have a look. It stimulates the cortex to release cortisol. Stimulates the cortex to release aldosterone. And it stimulates the cortisol to release androgens. Androgens. All right, these are three hormones that are released upon stimulation from ACTH, which has come from the anterior pituitary gland. And what do they all do? Actually, there's two hormones that are released from the medulla, which I should talk about, right? So while they're not necessarily released by ACTH, they are to a small degree, but not specifically. Their adrenaline and noradrenaline Mainly adrenaline. All right. So, cortisol. What cortisol does is it's known as a glucocorticoid. First of all, all the hormones released from the cortex of the adrenal gland are steroid hormones. That's why they got the oid or corticoid on the end, telling you that it's steroid corticoid, all right? Glucocorticoid tells you that cortisol plays around with glucose levels. And what cortisol does when it's released is it finds organs or structures of the body that have stored glucose and tell them to be released. So glucose gets released into the bloodstream and blood glucose levels go up. So that's what cortisol does. It ends up boosting blood glucose levels. It doesn't just do it by finding stored glucose and releasing it into the blood. It does it by finding non-carbohydrate-based energy sources. So remember back in like week one, week two, we spoke about carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, right? Carbohydrates are made up of glucose predominantly, and that's an energy source. Fats are made up of fatty acids and triglycerides. That's an energy source. And then the last one is going to be the proteins and amino acids, right? Which can be an energy source. Cortisol can also tell proteins and fats to turn to glucose, increasing blood glucose levels. Any questions, just ask me. And let's do aldosterone before we go on to androgens. Aldosterone, what that does is it travels to the kidneys and tells the kidneys to reabsorb sodium. It increases sodium into the body, what we call reabsorption. All right, I want you to answer this. What is the consequence of if you Go to the kidneys. Why would we want to go to the kidneys and say, don't pee out sodium, bring it back into the body? What's the consequence of that? Any idea? If sodium gets reabsorbed into the body, something else gets reabsorbed into the body at the same time. Any idea? What do you think? I'll wait. Water, perfect. Water, water. Water, oh, you guys are legends. Yes, yes, yes. I love it, Reef. Wherever sodium goes, water follows. Think about it. You eat salty chips, you always want water. Wherever sodium goes, water follows. So, aldosterone goes to the kidney, says, don't pee out that sodium, throw it back into the blood. Therefore, water goes back into the blood and our blood volume goes up, which means our blood pressure goes up. So, aldosterone is released when we need blood pressure to increase. Increase blood pressure. I want you to think about this. Is there a relationship here? Because you need to think about it. There's, there's all evolutionary mechanisms as to why things are released, okay? So you may look at this and you go, okay, something needs to trigger the hypothalamus to release corticotropin-releasing hormone, which travels down the hypophyseal to release adrenal corticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. That's released. That travels to the cortex of the kidneys and it releases cortisol and aldosterone. Cortisol increases blood glucose levels. Aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption, which basically increases blood pressure. And at the same time, there's a small release of adrenaline and noradrenaline coming out. So, 
What do you think was the original stimulus to tell the hypothalamus to release corticotropin releasing hormone? What told it to do this? If the outcome is increased blood glucose, increased blood pressure, and a little bit of adrenaline and noradrenaline, what was the stimulus coming in? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Any idea? All right. Come on. Guess. Guess. Stress. Yes, Reef. You're doing brilliantly today. It is stress. Sympathetic nervous system. Now, Shy, with the sympathetic nervous system, what you're going to find is the hypothalamus actually controls it. So, the, so when I say to you the sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated from stress, in actual fact, stress stimulates the hypothalamus and that stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. So at the same time that the hypothalamus releases these hormones, it also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system coming down the thoracic lumbar system. All right, uh, dehydration. Now, Dim, dehydration, yes, but not in this scenario. So it can in this scenario and it does through another mechanism. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the future. So firstly, why do we want to increase blood glucose levels when we're stressed? Why do we want to increase blood pressure when we're stressed? All right. When you get stressed and you activate the sympathetic nervous system, you know it's fight or flight. This system gets activated to keep you alive when you're stressed, right? So whatever happens like pupil dilation, heart rate increases, airways open up, Peripheral blood vessels constrict, reshunt the blood to the muscles and so forth. This happens as well. Now, obviously the adrenaline and noradrenaline help the sympathetic nervous system, but also cortisol is released. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone. It's released to increase blood glucose levels. Why? Because our nervous system, like our brain, only uses glucose for energy. And if you're in a fight or flight scenario, you need that sympathetic nervous system activated and you need it fed, and you need it fed with glucose. So blood glucose levels go up. Th great thing is, most tissues of the body need cells that take glucose and let it in. Your nervous system doesn't, your brain doesn't need cells. Your brain doesn't need the insulin to tell glucose to come in, right? So there's that, increased blood glucose. Why blood pressure? Well, if your blood pressure is higher, what does that then mean? more tissues get oxygen and nutrients. And we know that the blood vessels are constricted in the periphery, so that blood's going to the muscles, which means high blood pressure, more blood going to those muscles, more oxygen and nutrients. So this is supporting that sympathetic effect of the sympathetic nervous system, all right? Now the androgens is another one. Androgens such as dihydroepiandosterone, uh, uh, androgen I should say, no, oh, endosterone was correct, uh, is part of basically the masculinization and it's basically what we call a secondary sex hormone. And doesn't really relate to what we're talking about this trimester. Next trimester, it will. All right, I think we're done with the first one, corticotropic releasing, corticotropin releasing hormone. Let's move on to the next one, which is thyrotropin releasing hormone. Any questions at the moment? If you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully I'm going through this in a way that's, that's understandable for you. All right, next one we're going to talk about is thyrotropin releasing hormone. So let's tick these off as we go through. Done that one. Now let's do thyrotropin releasing hormone. That gets released, portal system here, and it's gonna tell the anterior pituitary gland to release a hormone. What's the hormone here? This hormone is called thyroid stimulating hormone. Sometimes just known as TSH. That's what gets released. Sometimes you'll see it in your textbook written as thyrotropin. All right, so thyrotropin and thyroid stimulating hormones the same thing. So don't stress about that. What does thyroid stimulating hormone do? It goes to the thyroid and stimulates it. All right, your thyroid is a butterfly shaped gland hugging your trachea at the front like this and it produces thyroid hormone or to be more specifically, thyroid hormones. Let's have a look. 
So here's your thyroid. Hugging, so your trachea would be like that behind it, right? There's your trachea and there's your thyroid gland. So what happens is thyroid stimulating hormone comes along and it binds to receptors, right? When it binds to these receptors, it tells these cells, or what I should say, these groups of cells inside the thyroid, to do something. It actually tells them to pull these things in to make thyroid hormone. What it pulls in are things like the amino acid tyrosine and iodine. So, Thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid glands, specifically the thyroid stimulating hormone receptors. And these cells of the thyroid go, okay, let's make thyroid hormone. I'm gonna pull in tyrosine, I'm gonna pull in iodine. Tyrosine, iodine, and it pulls them both in, keeps pulling them in, pulls them in and creates thyroid hormone. And the two types of thyroid hormone is T3 and T4, right? And then they get released into the body. What T3 and T4 do is they're the thyroid hormone. Every time you hear thyroid or thyroid hormone, this is what they do. They, it's T3, T4, and they play a huge role in metabolism. Really important with metabolism. So that means how you metabolize foods, how you utilize energy, which has vast effects on fat deposition, has vast effects on temperature, thermoregulation, things like that. All right? Now, I want to talk about this for a second. Iodine. Chemical element in the body. Only place it's used is at the thyroid. Have you ever, and I want you to answer this question for me, have you ever seen at home that your table salt has iodine in it and it's called iodized salt? Yes or no? Have you seen that before? Have you seen iodized salt at home or maybe somewhere else? Yep. The show, seen it, anyone else seen it? Yep, Reef, Emily, lovely, perfect. Now, why? That salt doesn't normally have iodine in it. Salt doesn't have iodine associated with it. But what we've done is what we call fortification. We've taken salt and we've put iodine with it, right? And the reason why is to support the thyroid gland. Here's why. The way that we normally get our iodine is the soil contains iodine. Plants grow in the soil and the plants take the iodine. Animals eat the plants and the animals get the iodine and we eat both the animals and the plants and then we get the iodine. So ultimately, our iodine levels reflect the iodine levels of the soil on the area that we live. Now some places are high in iodine, most of Australia is pretty good. But there's places around the world where the iodine levels are low. And so what happens is this, or what can happen, I should say, is when these cells, after thyroid stimulating hormone's been released, it says make thyroid hormone. They go, okay. They pull in tyrosine and iodine, but there's no iodine. So they just pull in tyrosine. But they're not making thyroid hormone because we need iodine. So it keeps doing it, and it keeps pulling it in and pulling it in. And what they're pulling in is simply just all this tyrosine and some other stuff, and these groups of cells get bigger and fatter, bigger and fatter, bigger and fatter. And what happens is, the th as they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the thyroid itself gets bigger. Open up Google and type this word in for me. Goiter. G-O-I-T-E-R. Type that in. I want you to have a look at what a goiter is. What I've just explained is a goiter. Can somebody describe it? Once you've seen it, oh yeah, well, yes, okay, good point. G-O-I, we all know that I'm not the best speller there is. G-O-I-T-R-E, try that. Try either one, it's gonna pop up. So, what do you see? I want you to describe it real basically for me on the chat. Enlargement, yeah. Does it look like the throat has like a balloon in it? Because that's pretty much what a goiter looks like. Swelling, yeah. That was on an episode of Seinfeld. I don't remember that episode. I'm gonna have to go back and watch. Uh, swelling of the neck, bulging neck, enlargement in the throat. Okay, and that's simply because there's no iodine, right? So 
The thyroid gets bigger, trying to make thyroid hormone, but it still doesn't. So if it doesn't make thyroid hormone, then they've basically got hypothyroidism. So goiter is the result of one type of hypothyroidism. It's not the only type, but it's one type, which is iodine deficiency can result in hypothyroidism and can result in a goiter. Now, if we look at hyperthyroidism, where we create too much thyroid hormone, if we create too much thyroid hormone, let's draw this up and, and show how it works. That's called hyperthyroidism. So you've got the thyroid you've got these receptors, you've got TSH, they need to come along and bind to the receptor, and then that triggers these groups of cells to pull in the iodine and to pull in the tyrosine. But, here's the thing, sometimes, is that overactive, underactive? Oh, so hypo is underactive thyroid, hyper is overactive thyroid. So if somebody's hyperactive, they've got heaps of energy. If they're hypoactive, they don't have any energy. Um, abnormal enlargement of your thyroid gland. So let's have a look at hyperthyroidism, at least one of the most common causes. So it's got hyper, so this is overactive. Now, this is the usual scenario, TSH, receptor, iodine, tyrosine, and it spits out T3 and T4, which are the thyroid hormones. But for some people, they create all these antibodies, right? These are immune cells. They create these antibodies that bind to that TSH receptor. And if these antibodies bind to that TSH receptor, they stimulate thyroid hormone to be produced. And if thyroid hormone's being produced, it just keeps bumping it up. So what this is, is an autoimmune disease, and it's called Graves' disease. So what we've got is, what is the TSH stimulated by within the hypothalamus? So the TSH is stimulated by the thyrotropin releasing hormone. It is released in bursts, in waves. So a lot of hormones have like these peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs throughout the day, all right? Sometimes they go in accordance with the circadian rhythm. Sometimes hormones peak at night and drop during the day and some are vice versa. Thyroid hormone has the same similar rhythm. It peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. So there's gonna be various stimuli from the body. They're gonna be metabolic based stimuli, all right? So things like, well, we need to um, uh, take particular energy stores and utilize them, or we need to store energy stores, or it may have something to do with the thermogenic effects, so temperature regulation. So there's a whole bunch of input. That's why I didn't mention it, because there's a whole bunch of metabolic-based input that control the hypothalamus to release thyrotropin, going down, releasing that. All right, we're going to move on. Any questions, let me know. All right, next one is growth hormone releasing hormone. What do we got? It says, referring to the tube workbook for the week, the example for patient three, I was getting a bit confused on what hormone was being over, underproduced, would have something to do with ADH. Uh, can you type the question, copy and paste the question for me because I can't remember it off the top of my head. If you copy and paste the question, we'll have a chat about it and we can go through what the answer may be. In the meantime, let's talk about growth hormone releasing hormone. Gets released from the hypothalamus, travels down the hypophyseal portal system and triggers the release of growth hormone. Unsurprisingly, growth hormone releasing hormone triggers the release of growth hormone. So number three, so let's tick that off. Number three is growth hormone. Now this one's pretty easy to know what it does. Growth hormone stimulates growth of the body. So, growth hormone, sometimes just written as GH, what it does is it has anabolic. So you heard of anabolic steroids? People who take anabolic steroids get big, right? So anabolism is growth. Catabolism is breakdown. And hormones play a role 
in this process. So growth hormone is anabolic. It's for growth, makes, you know, makes sense. Growth hormone affects bone, affects muscle, affects the liver, affects fatty tissue, which is called adipose tissue. And what it does is it tells bone to grow, tells muscle to grow, tells the liver to release glucose, so it increases blood glucose, tells fat tissue to release energy, so it increases energy stores. The reason why these two things happen is because in order to grow and develop, you need energy available. So the liver releases energy, fat releases energy, and your bone grows and your muscle grows. Now, Growth hormone is really important in early development, right? So it also plays a big role in differentiation. What that means is early on when you're developing, in order for one tissue to become like this and another tissue to become like this, growth hormone helps that differentiation process. Um, so what do we got? Sorry, here is a 54-year-old male suffering frequent urination, nausea, constipation, bone pain. His blood calcium levels are measured to be 12.5 milligrams per deciliter when the normal is 9 to 10. Is that all the information there is for that one? Maddie, is there any more? Is that all that was part of the, uh, part of the question? If there's more, just pop the rest in. And what, is, what will the specific question ask? Does it say what hormone is affected? I can't remember. I wrote these wrote this a little while ago. Um, so, that's what growth hormone does. Let's Google something else, right? Can you Google acromegaly for me? I probably spelled this one wrong too, but that's okay. Type in acromegaly and describe what you see with acromegaly. Acromegaly is a issue with growth hormone. So, look that up. Then, at the same time, that's all the info. Okay, thanks, Maddie. I'll address that once we finish growth hormone. And then I want you to type in gigantism. Megali. I got that right? Acrome yeah, I got it right. Okay. Acromegaly. All right, big fingers. That's definitely true. What else do you see? Now, compare Google gigantism versus acromegaly and have a look at how the people look differently. How do, what's their phenotype, the way they present? How is it different? They're both issues with growth hormone, but they look different. So can anybody have a look and tell me what they think? Overgrowth, definitely bones increase in size. Is there any difference between acromegaly and gigantism that you can see? Like visibly, you don't have to read any of it, but if you compare acromegaly versus, uh, what can you see? You're very, you're very right. Increases in bone and muscle size, basically increases in growth. Height, definitely, individuals grow higher. Taller, I should probably say. Height is increased in gigantism, unlike acromegaly. All right, let's focus on that. Thank you, Shai. That is perfect. So, height is increased in gigantism, but not acromegaly. Here's the difference between the two. Both are problems with overactivity of growth hormone. Both are problems with overactivity of growth hormone, but gigantism occurs prepubescent. Acromegaly occurs postpubescent. What does that mean? It means that when you're young, your bones haven't yet, not all of your bones have yet fused and not all of the cartilage, because when, you when you're first born, up until about two years of age, your bones are basically like cartilage. They're really rubbery, bendy, hard to break, right? But when you grow old and you start hitting teenage years, that cartilage turns to bone and hardens. Now, if you have an overactivity, overactivity of your growth hormone, before all that happens, you get uniform growth. So you're basic, you basically look like anybody else, you're just a lot taller and a lot bigger, right? Uniform growth, all aspects of your body grow in accordance with the right ratio of one another because those bones can all grow together, the muscles can all grow together. But if you have a growth hormone overactivity after pubescence, 
So after this cartilage is turned to bone and the bone is solidified, only certain structures can grow. And these structures include the forehead and the jaw and the fingers, for example. They can't go any higher because the long bones won't let that happen. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the difference between acromegaly and gigantism and their overactivity of growth hormone. How does this happen? Most common cause is a tumor in the pituitary gland. Now remember that tumors are cancers and cancers are overactive cells. So you've got overactive cells in the pituitary gland. You can also Google the tallest man ever to live called Robert Wadlow. So Google Robert Wadlow. Again, probably misspelt the name. Can anyone tell me what was the cause of his gigantism? And I'm pretty sure what you're going to find is that it has something to do with the anterior pituitary gland. You'll probably find that he had something like hyperplasia of the anterior pituitary gland, which is simply, it's not cancer, it's just an over, these cells just grew too much. And if they grew too much, they released too much growth hormone and he got gigantism. All right. Just gonna have a quick drink. All right, let's talk about gonadotropin releasing hormone. Abnormally high level of human growth hormone. Perfect. All right, which is caused due to overactive cells here at the anterior pituitary gland. All right, tick that one off. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. That comes down and it releases gonadotropins. So this hormone travels to our gonads to release more hormones. All right. In actual fact, there's two gonadotropins. So it says gonadotropins because there's not just one hormone like we've spoken about for others. There's two. So let's have a look. The gonadotropins, the two of them are follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now, this trimester, do not stress about the gonadotropins because next trimester when we do the reproductive systems, they will be our focus. All right, but this trimester, I'm going to give you a bit of a break. I'll quickly tell you what they do though. The gonads are going to be the testes and the ovaries, right? Now, both are our organs for sexual reproduction and FSH and LH work at both. And what they actually do is this. For the testes, it plays a big role for sperm maturation and testosterone production. For the ovaries, it plays a big role in egg maturation, which is basically the female version of sperm, egg maturation. Or sperm is the male version of the egg. And also plays an important role for um, ovulation. So these are two really important roles that both FSH and LH play for the testes and FSH and LH play for the ovaries. They're both gonadotropins and this happens in those respective gonads. All right. Like I said, that's a quick one because we're going to focus on that next trimester. When we do the reproductive system. All right. Next one. Last one is prolactin releasing hormone. Prolactin releasing hormone down the hypophyseal system, releases prolactin, and prolactin is all in the name, prolactation, prolactation, lactation is the production of milk, so simply put, prolactin goes to the breast and promotes milk production, not milk ejection, but milk production.
That's basically what prolactin do. It's pro-lactation. Pro meaning for lactation. All right, we are done with the anterior pituitary gland. We now need to look at the posterior pituitary gland. Now, there's not as many hormones. There's only two, so that makes it easier. So we won't have to spend a huge amount of time on it. Any questions on the anterior so far? Can I get a thumbs up or a all good if everything's all good? Otherwise, please ask me a question. I need to know if you guys are understanding this. I don't want you to sit back going, oh my God, this is the most horrendous thing I've ever heard. What are we? Big smiley faces from Olivia, thank you. Shaz is on top of it, thank you. Thank you, Reef. Perfect. All good. All right, I'm glad. Now, you can watch this, obviously, anytime. This is going to be saved. So I understand that you might go, I don't get it now, but you can watch it whenever you like. You'll get it. Promise. Promise. If I can get it, you can get it. I'm not the smartest person in the world. All right. Hypothalamus posterior pituitary. Here's the thing. It's not a bloodstream that connects the two. It's nervous tissue that connects the two. Now I'm just going to draw one neuron just to highlight, but there's obviously more. It's nervous tissue. So anterior pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus through blood. Posterior pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus through nervous tissue. Now this is what this means, right? It means that the hypothalamus is part of your brain. So it's nervous tissue. The posterior pituitary gland is nervous tissue. So that means when you were growing and developing, the posterior pituitary gland began with the hypothalamus and stretched down. But the anterior pituitary gland began separate to the hypothalamus and moved up to connect. So that means that the posterior pituitary gland is what we call neuroendocrine. It's both nervous and endocrine. And the anterior pituitary gland is a true endocrine tissue. So hopefully that makes sense. What factors control the degree of cellular response to a hormone? Ooh, okay. Let's do that quickly before we move on. What factors, and then I can answer, sorry, then I can answer Maddie's question. Sorry, Maddie. So what factors control the degree of cellular response to a hormone? A couple of factors, all right. There's a receptor. There's a hormone. The question is, what could happen to increase that hormone binding to that receptor and having a downstream effect. A couple of things. How much hormone we have. The more hormone we have, the more likely it's going to bind and have its effect. So, quantity. That's one. Next one is whether it fits in the receptor, right? So if you've got a hormone that's square shaped, it's not going to fit in there, right? So this is specificity. And then the last one is affinity. How likely is it to remain bound to that receptor? So you may have a hormone that jumps in and then jumps back out, or you may have a hormone that jumps in and stays in there. And again, this has to do with the shape and the number and all that type of stuff. So the three most important things that can affect how a hormone binds to a receptor and have downstream effects is the quantity, so how much hormone, the specificity, how specific it is to binding, and the affinity, how long it lasts in that receptor. Hopefully that answers your question, Dim. All right, let's go back to Maddie's quick question. Now, Maddie's quick question, I'm just gonna go back to my computer to read, was about the workbook. Uh, okay, so 54-year-old male suffering from frequent urination, nausea, constipation, and bone pain. His blood calcium levels are measured to be 12 milligrams per deciliter, which is above the normal 9 to 10. The question is, which hormone is under or overproduced? What do people think? What do you think? The outcome there is blood calcium is high. Do you remember what we spoke about in the skeletal system? There was a homeostatic control mechanism we spoke about in the skeletal system. One that stimulated osteoclasts to break down bone. One that worked with vitamin D. One that increased the absorption of calcium. Parathyroid hormone. Correct. That's what I would say. So hopefully that helps. All right. Now let's focus on 
posterior pituitary gland. Unless you had more questions, Matty, just let me know. All right, posterior pituitary gland. Here's the thing. With the anterior, hormones are made here and released, and hormones are made here and released. But for the posterior pituitary gland, the hormones that are here are produced in the hypothalamus and travel down here to be stored. So the two hormones, right, they're produced here. And they travel down. And they are simply stored in the posterior pituitary gland. So they don't produce... Oh, thanks, Maddie. I ho hope that helps. Produced in the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary. These are the two hormones. Oxytocin. And the second one... Antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH, and sometimes known in your textbook as vasopressin. I, the only time I really read vasopressin is when I'm reading an American journal or textbook. All right? So we refer to it as ADH. All right, here's what these two hormones do. Oxytocin. All right, actually, I want you to tell me. When you hear the word oxytocin, what do you think? What does oxytocin do? In your mind, you hear the word oxytocin and you start thinking, what? Oh, wait, I'll see. I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I do apologize. You hear oxytocin and you think, produce breast milk. So, prolactin produces it, but Oxytocin releases it, ejects it. Oxytocin ejects it. Labor as well, love-hate hormone. Oh, you guys, have, you've covered it all. So we've got uterine contraction by lovely. Olivia said the same thing. Emily says production of breast milk. Mackenzie says releases breast milk. Lovely breast milk let down. Yeah, let down's a great way of explaining it. And Maddie says love-hate. Oh, you guys have covered it. This is a great tutorial group. I wish we were doing this face to face. It saddens me that we have to do it over the internet. All right, oxytocin. Oxytocin is breast milk ejection. And it, it ejects because smooth muscle are contracting. So oxytocin plays a real big role in smooth muscle contraction. It also, uterine contractions. I was on the ABC last night talking about the uterus. The uterus is obviously an amazing strong. It starts as being 50 grams, and at the end of pregnancy, it weighs a kilo. Starts at 50 grams, finishes at weighing a kilo, and most of it is muscle. And it's relatively strong, that muscle, contracting to push that bub out. And the last thing is, I said love-hate hormone there, which is one way of explaining it. I'm just gonna say it solidifies relationships. And let me tell you why. Because you're right by saying love-hate. It does simplify it. But let's talk about that for a sec, right? So, breast milk ejection, that's easy. Or let down. Ejection, let down. Whichever term you want to use, that's fine. You do contractions, that's cool. Get bub out. Solidifies relationships. So, we all think of oxytocin's release. Ah, makes us happy. All right. When a mother is breastfeeding her bub, the milk's being ejected because oxytocin's being released, right? At the same time, mum feels good about doing this. She feels good because of the oxytocin and dopamine, but oxytocin. So what happens is, when you feel good about doing something, you want to keep doing that thing. Now, when we look at evolution, this is a great idea. Evolution has made it so that when you feed your baby, keeping it alive, you feel good about it and you do it more. Baby survives. And what that means is baby can reproduce itself and so forth. So this is a great evolutionary mechanism. But what they've found is it's not just this feel-good molecule. they found oxytocin levels boost right up when they look at the oxytocin levels of warring tribe members. So they hate these other individuals and their oxytocin is through the roof. So what it does is it gets released anytime some relationship is being built. Uh, is there any disease related to oxytocin hormone? Oh... 
a good question. Look, I don't know of any, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. I can't think of one. The, the body is strange and the body does things and there's always an over-release and under-release of things. If you can have normal amounts, you can have abnormal amounts. I don't know what the clinical manifestation of that would be. If anyone can find out and type it, brilliant. I love learning that. So I actually haven't heard of an hypo or hypo oxytocin release. Antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone, so di diuresis, not diarrhea, that's different. What does diuresis mean? Can somebody type in any idea what diuresis means? If you can tell me, diuresis. What do you reckon? Urination, perfect. Regulates water in the blood, perfect. All right. I like to think of this. So diuresis, urination, increased excretion of urine, increase of urine. Low oxytocin levels have been linked to autism. Interesting. Didn't know that. The things you learn. So, di so when I think diuresis, I think peeing, right? Antidiuresis means anti-peeing. So this hormone gets released and it doesn't stop you from peeing, but what it does is it goes to the kidneys and tells the kidneys, hey, don't pee out that water, throw it back in the body. So what it does is it increases water reabsorption. Now, if you increase water, reabsor uh, water reabsorption back into the body, it goes into the blood, right? Which increases blood volume and also increases blood pressure. Now here's the thing, in what scenario, so ignore this stuff at the moment, in what scenario would you want to reabsorb water? Someone said it way, maybe like 35 minutes ago, in what scenario would you want to reabsorb water? Come on, what's gonna happen? What do you think? You want to reabsorb water in times of, Dehydration. Thank you, lovely. I think you were the one that said it earlier too, or it could have been shy. So, when you're dehydrated, this is a stimulus to the hypothalamus. It does a couple of things. Hypothalamus, all of a sudden you go, I'm thirsty. You know that thought always comes out of nowhere. You go, I'm thirsty. And you take a drink. That's coming from your hypothalamus. I'm thirsty. But it also sends a signal down to release ADH which goes to your kidneys and pulls the water back in. Now here's how this, so the hypothalamus can sense dehydration. The question is, how does it sense dehydration? That seems to be a strange thing, like this. If you've got a container that's filled with water and you put a whole bunch of salt in it, right? A whole bunch of salt or sodium. And you measure the concentration of that salt in the water. And let's just make up a number. Let's just say the concentration of that salt in the water is 300, right? Whatever that means, but that's what it is. Now let's say I dehydrate that bucket. I dehydrate it, that means I only take out water. So I take out this water and I take out half of it. Answer me this, what happens to the concentration inside of that bucket? Is it become, does it become more concentrated or less concentrated? What do you think? High concentration, yeah. It becomes more concentrated. So that means it goes from 300 maybe to 320. Now, this change in concentration of fluid is called osmolarity. You've heard of osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water that's determined by concentration changes. So when concentration changes occur, it's called osmolarity. If we go from 300 to 320, that's an increase in osmolarity, and this is what the hypothalamus measures. It measures changes in osmolarity. For example, it basically says, how much sodium is present in the fluid surrounding me? That's what it does. And if it's too high, it releases antidiuretic hormone. But you can also release ADH when your blood pressure is low too. And that's the same with aldosterone, right? Because that increases blood pressure too. Both aldosterone and ADH work together to increase blood volume and blood pressure. And both of these happen when blood volume is low. I don't 
I don't really understand what it means in the lecture notes by released in response to increased osmotic pressure concentration in the blood. It's exactly that. So all it's saying is, okay, so the hypothalamus is just a collection of cells, right? So let's just say here's a collection of cells and that's the hypothalamus. Cells are surrounded by liquid, right? So they've got liquid inside of them, they've got liquid surrounding them. So outside the cell is extracellular fluid. So you've got all this fluid surrounding this cell. Now, normally the concentration of this fluid outside is around about 300. And the units that we measure is called milliosmoles. Don't stress about that. But it's 300. Just like the scenario with the container. If I were to take just the water out, so you do a whole bunch of exercise, and you sweat so much you lose all this water, it becomes more concentrated out here. And that 300 turns to maybe 320 milliosmoles. It becomes more concentrated. These cells can measure how much sodium is here compared to the water. It measures that concentration change, which, me which means it measures the osmotic difference. The osmotic, so think about it, right? If it becomes more concentrated outside the cell, Water from inside the cell wants to be pulled out. Does that make sense? Remember tonicity, right? If you've got a container with a membrane and you've got water but you've got heaps of stuff dissolved on that side of the membrane, what happens is water wants to get pulled across. If that's outside the cell and that's inside the cell, water wants to get pulled out of the cell. Same thing happens here. When you get dehydrated, what happens is the water from inside the cell wants to be pulled out. The hypothalamus can feel this. It, it feels the water leaving its cells, and that's measuring osmotic pressure changes. Olivia, does that make sense? If not, I'll try and figure out another way to explain it, but I hope that makes sense. That's how the hypothalamus works. When it measures that change, that shift in fluid, that's measuring osmotic pressure changes, and that triggers ADH to be released. Is that okay? Sort of. That's okay. You said, oh yeah, at the beginning, I take that as a win. Because it's not a simple concept. So we'll keep going through it. All right. It's time. We've done this for too long. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't go through the pancreas and insulin stuff. But I'll release a little video for you to watch in regards to that. It'll go for five minutes. But apart from that, thanks everyone. I hope that was good and enjoyable. hope it wasn't too boring. I know it's a lot. My throat's killing me. I'll see you all soon. Do your online quiz. It's due on Friday and it's all the nervous system. All right. Thanks, team.